Okay, so this week the assignment I've got up on the screen here. I guess let me bring it up full, uh, fully here. Okay, where to go? There we go. Okay, so the idea was a follow-up on the discussion we had had during the last lecture about uh, posterior predictive checks. Uh, in particular, I assigned uh, doing a few graphical posterior predictive checks based upon the hands-on example number two. And the, the first one there's, is actually uh, doing the one particular type of um, posterior predictive check uh, and doing it two different ways so that you can get some experience doing it both ways. And we talked briefly about the potential advantages or disadvantages of one versus the other. But the idea was to do a posterior predictive checking plot for looking at uh, factor 10A inhibition as a function of drug concentration. Uh, and you know, so, and in particular, we'd be talking about using population predictions here. In other words, predictions for for new patients as opposed to individual predictions. So the idea would be to do posterior predictions, uh, calculate their their medians, uh, the you know the medians of the MCMC predictions, and 90% credible intervals. Uh, on there and plot those as curves and then overlay on that the observed data as symbols. And then I, the, the idea was to do it in two different ways. One was to actually use wind bugs as the mechanism for doing the simulations and the other one was to do the simulations in R. Uh, and as I commented before, there are reasons why you might choose to do one versus the other. Uh, the advantage of doing it in wind bugs is since you're modeling it, modeling this data with wind bugs, you've already written the model. Uh, it's already there. So it's possible in this case to do the simulations in the same framework using the, you know, using a model, uh, you know, using the very same model uh, in the, so you basically program the model once as opposed to doing it R where you have to program the model a second time. Uh, so that's one additional effort to do that, and two, there's the potential for error in the process of translating it from one uh, piece of software to another. Uh, I guess the other aspect here, though, is that when you're doing it in wind bugs, uh, you may be using a lot more uh, computation time than doing it in R in some instances. Uh, that's particularly true if the you know, if the computation expense of doing the predictions is fairly high, uh, and again, this is particularly true if you've had if you're going to be doing thinning, as part of the uh, as part of your wind bugs run, because when you do the thinning, it's still going to be doing all these predictions even for the MCMC iterations that you're not even going to save. So it could be fairly costly in terms of computation for some types of models. For relatively simple models, such as the one in hands-on example two, it's not a particularly onerous thing. Uh, let's see. So, let me see what you're saying, Yeming. It says, I only see the title of the webinar. That's curious. Did you switch to your computer screen? Yes, I did. Let's double check and make sure uh, that uh, go go to meeting is actually thinks it's pointing at the correct one let's see here apparently you're hearing me I'm trying to figure out where you would see a title uh, because anyway the short answer is yes I have switched to my computer screen thinks I have let me double check it's a screen sharing let me make sure that I didn't I might have done something silly. No, I did something silly. I didn't push the button. Okay, the screen should be coming up for you now. Sorry, that's my error. Fortunately, it sounds like you got audio, so that's not a problem. And what I was talking about here, just to be clear, was this uh, the first component uh, in our bullets right here. 
uh, talking about doing the posterior predictive checks for factor 10A inhibition as a function of drug concentration. Uh, so, and we we're just talking about the trade-offs between doing the doing the simulations in wind bugs versus doing them in R. Okay, uh, sorry, I was just looking at a message there. Um, okay, so uh, again, the trade-offs here is it might co be more costly computationally to do it in wind bugs for some cases, but then I was just commenting that for our current hands-on example, uh, there's the computations aren't that onerous. Uh, they don't take that long, so you don't really lose uh, much computation time or you know use much more by doing it in wind bugs than doing it on R. In fact, it might even be faster uh, because R also has some drawbacks in terms of doing computations. Um, so, but the idea is for you to be able to see both ways of dealing with that kind of a problem. Then the next part of the exercise was to do uh, some posterior predictive checks um, where we're going to be looking at them in the form of either density plots or histograms of some sort of derived uh, parameters or derived statistics uh, for, our, for our observed data. In this case, what I was assigning was to do the mean peak of the factor 10A inhibition time courses or the mean AUCs or not or and the mean AUCs of those time courses uh, and to do that by treatment arm. Uh, so we'd be looking at so we're, and by mean here I do mean mean over the individuals. So that's what you would do with the observed data and then you would also take the uh, posterior predictions uh, that we collected out of wind bugs uh, and for each MCMC iteration uh, you would also calculate the a mean peak and a mean AUC and because you have a separate value for those for each one of those iterations you get a distribution that we're going to be looking at and comparing how that distribution compares with that for the observed value. Okay let's start with the first one. Uh, now actually the fr uh, oh also I don't know if you would have seen an email but I'll mention it I had uh, uh, I posted the an R script that provides the solutions uh, for this for this uh, set of homework, and in particular, it provides the solution for uh, the second bullet of the first item here. So, generating the posterior predictions in R, and then doing these posterior prediction plots down here. The second ones where we're looking at density or histogram plots. The the approach using the simulation inside of wind bugs is actually done already uh, and is and is in the solution set uh, that's in the USB drive that was distributed to you and in fact that's where we're going to start is is look at that is, is to look at that uh, let's go ahead and shrink that let's go to Windows world Okay, so what we're going to look at here then, uh, let's uh, first of all open up wind bugs. Uh, let's shrink that up a little bit here and let me go down to, uh, well, what I, if you recall last week what I did is I hid the original solution in a folder here called hide. So let me go down and grab that. Uh, alternatively, in fact, rather than do that, oh, I don't want to restart now. Let's see. Actually, let's go down to the solutions folder because that's a place where you would have all the results for this. Let's go to hands on two. Uh, let me grab the uh, wind bugs model and let's look at that first. Okay, uh, let me deal with the f wrapping here. Let's see. Okay, so this is the original model uh, that we would work with, and what we put together last week should have been, uh, if not identical, very, very similar to what you're looking at right here. Uh, the part that is different is right, let me highlight it here, is right here. 
where uh, where I'm doing another simulation. So recall in the original model, we've got our inter-individual variation taken care of in the first loop. Then we go over all of our observations, and that's where we specify our final likelihood term inside there. But then I'm throwing in another loop here, and right here. And we can see in this loop, I'm looping from 1 to some value I called n sim, And that quantity is specified in the data set. In fact, let me pull up R to show you where some of that is specified. Okay, so here's the R script. Let's scroll down to where I specify the data set. And in the data set, notice the last line. I define three constant values here. One cmin, cmax, and nsim. Uh, cmin and cmax describe the lower bound and the upper bound of the concentrations that I want to simulate over. Uh, and then nsim says how many how many points do I want to simulate? So what this is what and what I'm going to do in WinBugs is take that range going from zero to sixteen hundred, break it up into uh, actually break it up into two hundred equal intervals, and which correspond to two hundred one values. Thus the nsim equals two hundred one. So those, that's all I need to do to specify what I'm going to need in order to do that. Uh, and then inside WinBugs, I take those values. And so you can see I'm going to go here from 1 to n sim, which is going to be 201 in this case. And the first line right here is going to calculate a concentration value. So I define a new term here, c sim. That's going to be the simulated concentrations or you know, I'm just going to specify a set of those which are going to be equally spaced going from C min here to C max. So this is all this line right here is doing is doing that calculation. So when I get done, I'm going to end up with 201 values of C sim which are equally spaced over that, that interval. Then I go through and I do my posterior predictions. The first step being to uh, generate an EC50, or in particular a log EC50, from my inter-individual uh, variation model here. So that's where you see the, the normal uh, distribution showing up here. I get the log EC50, convert it to EC50. Notice I've stuck before, I've already used up the uh, term EC50.pred for the posterior predictions I did above. Uh, in uh, in the other sections here, and recall the previous ones were calculating predictions at pre-specified times. Now what I want to do is get the predictions at pre-specified concentrations. So anyway, I just gave it a different name, so I called it ec50.pred2. Similarly, I calculate this thing I call, well actually I sort of jump a step here, let's go to fxa.pred2. That's going to be my expected value for the factor 10a inhibition uh, corresponding to that, the concentration C sim i here. And notice here I have to pull in the, uh, the EC50 value I just simulated for the inter-individual variation there. And then finally we throw in the residual variation term right here. So all I've done then is essentially the same kind of simulation I'm doing here, but again, instead of doing it at a set of pre-specified times, I'm doing it at a set of pre-specified concentrations. And in doing so, I, I get a uh, basically a cleaner description of the posterior predictions, uh, uh, posterior predictions in terms of uh, concentration as opposed to in terms of time. So that will take care of our simulations uh, in here. 
Uh, so that's really not part of the fitting process at all. It just uses the uh, the MCMC samples generated by the fitting process uh, to do these simulations. And then I simply save uh, the FXA PRED2 values uh, as part of the things that I'm going to monitor when I run uh, run this WinBugs model. So let's go back to uh, go back to our R code in fact. So for example if you look then further down at the R code you'll see that among the thing the other random variables that I told it to monitor I've got fxa.pred2 which are exactly the predictions that I want. And what I do with those shows up and when we scroll down a ways here not too far let's see yeah there not there oops I went too far I need to go slower here that's okay that's where it's there it is okay it shows up right here so if you scroll down you'll find a section here where it's you can see it's labeled here something about prediction of future observations in a new subject and these are our so-called population simulations and here is where I grab the fxa.pred2 values from the uh, from the posterior matrix and then I do and here's uh, where I combine the the observed data with the posterior predictions. So I probably should have broken this up into two pieces to make it more readable. Uh, but let's let's ignore the R bind stuff here and break. We can sort of break it up conceptually here. Let me widen this so we get the whole picture. Uh, notice here, there's a line. In, uh, what I'm doing is creating a data frame, so you can see that. And the data frame is going to have columns named C O N C for our concentrations, uh, FXA for our factor 10A inhibition, uh, and uh, type for whether we're talking about a 5th percentile, a median, or a 95th percentile in here. And then a bunch of the rest of this is kind of bookkeeping. So right now I'm focusing on the first data frame that's being combined here. So to get the concentrations, I didn't actually save those CSIM values because those are easily regenerated. So what you see right here in this statement here, uh, notice, well, first of all, let's ignore the repeat part. Let's just look at the part right, uh, right there. So here I'm actually repeating the calculation that you saw inside that loop within bugs. So I'm taking the CMIN value and I'm pulling that out of that bugs data list. So I'm getting the CMIN value. Uh, then I go from, uh, I generate a bunch of values here. So I go from 0 to NSIM minus 1. Uh, multiply that times the difference between CMAX and CMIN. That's going to generate that little, that section going right from here to here is going to generate a bunch of equally spaced uh, actually, they're not equally spaced yet. It's just going to generate. Actually, you know what? Let me step. Let me use this. It's easier for me to describe it this way. This right here, where I take the overall difference and divide it by the number of intervals. So n sim minus one is the number of intervals. That's going to give me the distance between uh, between values in here. And so, so when I what I can do to get any particular value, I multiply that difference by whether it's the first value, second value, and so on down the way. And so I'm going to be multiplying it by values, in this case, that go all the way from 0 up to n sim minus 1, and that'll give me the difference from c min, and then I just add in c min. So that mess right there will calculate that sequence of values going from c min to c max. And then, because I'm going to do, I'm going to create a data frame that's going to contain three different statistics: the fifth percentile, the median, and the 95th percentile. I'm going to take that vector. I'm going to repeat it three times. So the first set is going to correspond to the fifth percentile, the second to the median, and so on. Uh, so that's why it's all embedded inside of this repeat statement right here. 
then the next step in here is I take, recall that, uh, that pred, we just defined up top here. There I've grabbed, uh, pred is going to be a matrix where the rows correspond to the MCMC MC iterations and the columns are going to correspond to the different observations. Uh, in here and because of the way we calculated them they will be ordered from C min to C max uh, in that uh, and what I'm doing here in this a few different steps here is the first step here where I say apply uh, over the columns uh, the quantile function and I'm telling it to calculate by specifying probs equals 0 0.05, 0 0.5, and 0 0.95. That's where I'm telling it to calculate the 5th, 50th, and 95th percentiles in here. That's going to return a, an object which is going to be in the form of a, well, it'll be a matrix. The number of rows of that matrix is going to be three corresponding to the three different percentiles, and the number of columns will correspond to uh, is going to correspond to the number of values actually it'll be 201 in this case because it'll be the number of simulated concentration values that they correspond to um, and then uh, the next couple of steps here are just there to take the transpose and then say as vector is just going to unroll that matrix out in a form that will appropriately match with the concentrations I've specified in the first column. And then finally the last step is to create a label telling which of those numbers are fifth percentiles, which of them are medians, and which of them are 95th percentiles. So if you get you if you do this a lot you'll get used to that kind of strategy so that it's it's complicated to figure out the first time but once you got it it's it's something you just find yourself repeating over and over. So that will create our our predict our posterior predictions, uh, and in particular, it'll create the fifth, fiftieth, and ninety-fifth uh, percentiles of those posterior predictions that we can plot then as curves. And then what I've done is I've bound that with the observed values. So you can see here for the observed values, I've got the observed concentrations, the observed factor 10a inhibition. Uh, and the type in this case we're just going to call observed uh, in this. So I create that as a data frame and then I just combine those data frames using the rbind function. And at that point we've actually got exactly the object that we want in order to create the plot that we want to create. Uh, and that's what's going on okay here we go in the uh, within this XY plot uh, function right here. Uh, so you can see I'm going to say FXA, that's our factor 10A inhibition, is going to be on the Y axis. Concentration will be on the X axis. Uh, and the data set is the X1 data frame we just created. And groups equals type means you can create a separate uh, basically a separate curve or separate set of symbols for each type and the types being our different percentiles and the observed data. Uh, and then the rest of this is all formatting stuff. Uh, first of all we have to use panel superpose in order to be able to have that grouping uh, and actually in the current value of R I probably didn't even need to say that. I'm used to doing that from an old S++ habit. I think it's sufficient once you say groups it knows to use panel superpose. Uh, it tells it, uh, type here is telling it okay if it's one of those three percentiles make them lines, if it's the observed make it points. Uh, and then I define things like dash lines for the fifth and fiftieth percentile and then use uh, just a solid curve for the median and no curve at all for the uh, for the data you know I specify some colors I forget one of those is red and the other is blue and the other is black and, you know put some X and Y labels in here and there again the rest of this is just formatting uh, some labels uh, here and there so let me show you what that thing looks like uh, let's go to uh, 
up here. Come on, computer, don't slow down now. Okay, let's see. Uh, we're down in the solutions. Let's... Uh, Come on, open up. Okay, don't tell me parallels is going to cause me grief here. Okay, I mean hands on two. Okay, I forget exactly how far down this is. We'll just pick one to start with and, s and then find our way there. Not that one, but let me make it bigger and start scrolling down to, to find where the one is we want. There we go. That's and what you get is this is the this is the result then of that set of commands. So you can see we've got our inhibition of factor 10a activity on the y-axis, our plasma concentrations on the x, uh, the circles representing all of our observed data for all the individuals and all the times. Uh, then we've got a uh, our the blue curve here is the posterior median, and the uh, the dashed red curves here then are the fifth and ninety fifth percentiles, so they represent point wise uh, ninety percent credible intervals. So that was the that's the approach then using uh, using wind bugs to do the simulation. Now let's take a look at what what you need to do in order to do this uh, just using R given only uh, the posterior samples for the uh, for the parameters rather than posterior predictions generated out of bugs. So let's go ahead and uh, well I can leave that open. Let me open up another R script and this is the one I've posted on the uh, I've posted on the course website. Scroll up here. Let's see, let's get out of solutions. There we go. Come on, open up. I put it in the, uh, for now I put it in, on my computer here, I've put it inside the ME hands-on 2 directory here and it's called PPC examples uh, dot R here so let's open that up so let's go ahead and shrink this other one here so we don't have to look at it Okay, let's see. Let me widen this out here so you can see it all. Okay, why when I widen it you got skinnier? That's not what I wanted. being persnickety with me. Let's see. Okay, what's going on now? I'll just make it win whole window size. Okay, here we go. Okay, so here's the, the contents of that. The first part of it is actually I pretty much just copied right from the, um, uh, the ME hands-on to our script that we had used so that I can sort of set things like the, uh, the model name and, and some of the paths for where things are. In the end, the only real path, the only path that's particularly critical for me to have is the path to where the the wind bugs results got saved so in the case of um, 
in, in the case here, let me point you to where that is. So, for instance, when we ran, let me go up to, here we go. So when we ran the example last time, it inside of the ME hands on 2 directory, it created another directory called ME hands on 2. And if we go inside that, okay, we've got a whole lot of stuff here, but the the key part I wanted to look at widen this so you can see the names of the files completely. Okay, oh come on. There we go. For some reason Windows is responding very slowly. Okay, uh, right here there's a, a, a file here called me2handson2.fit.r save and that's a that is where our mcmc samples got saved uh, when we did the run uh, the last time uh, so that thing's going to be an r object containing uh, the containing those uh, and recall what the name we use for that r object is bugs.fit in the examples that we've done so that contains that bugs.fit object. So that's the thing I want to get to. So I, the most important path for me to have is the path to that particular file so that we can read it in. So there's various things going on here, but the critical thing here is is to be able to define that. And in the end, that's going to be uh, contained essentially within this example dir. It actually is a subfolder of the, uh, the exact example dir path that we have right here. Uh, but that's where I'm also going to use is my work directory is going to be to use that ME2 hands on 2 folder as my working directory. Uh, so we take care of that. Uh, we might use some objects in the Beagle SB utilities.r script script there, so I retain that. But I don't need things like R to win bugs or code or anything like that. So, okay, automatic updates. Okay. Okay, oops, too far. Okay, so we take care of all that. Then I need to do things like uh, I need the data set, uh, the same data set that we originally worked with because I'm going to be overlaying that on this. So you can see here where I'm grabbing the original data file uh, in there. So I take care of that. Then the next step here is this load statement is where I'm going out and getting that uh, that object that contains the bugs fit object with all of our MCMC samples. Uh, and then uh, the rest of this is just reformatting that a bit and creating our our posterior matrix that we often work with. So we've got that in place. Uh, then I open up a uh, a graphics device, and in other words a PDF file essentially that will contain the plots that we create. Uh, and then the key thing I need to do is I need to write our model out in the form of a an R function. Uh, and that's what we're doing right here. Now because all I'm going to be doing is the posterior predictions over a population here, I don't need to worry about sort of simulating multiple populations in a sense. It's sufficient uh, to in effect simulate an individual and then simulate a, a sequence of observations for that individual and that's what's going to go on in here. So here I just defined, gave it a name, I just called it calc fxainh. Uh, it's going to be a function uh, here of both the, uh, this p is going to represent a row from the posterior matrix. So we're actually going to call this function once for each row of our posterior matrix. Uh, and then the conc here uh, is is going to be the sequence of concentrations at which we want to get predictions. So that's something that you'll calculate and specify when we do this. Uh, inside the function then, the first step here 
is to generate individual specific values of our EC50. Recall that was the only inter-individual random effect we had. And remember it was uh, log normal uh, with a mean here equal to, uh, uh, well, the mean, well, the mean of the uh, log normal distribution or uh, of the normal distribution inside here would be the log of the EC50 hat. So that's picking that off. Notice the way you can, since the posterior distribution actually uses names for the columns, you don't have to know which column it is numerically. It's sufficient to know uh, know the name. So and that, so here what I've done is, so when you pass the that row in here, it's going to be a vector where each element is named. So one of those elements is going to be named EC50 hat. So you just use that name inside quotes in here so that'll pick off the appropriate number. Uh, if you recall we also saved the standard deviation associated with that and we called it Omega EC50 and that's what we have right here. So for for a given call to this thing here we're going to call uh, we're going to call this line we're going to generate a single random effect so it'll be a value of EC50 for a single subject essentially. Uh, so we call that then the next step here is to calculate the expected values of factor 10a inhibition corresponding to the entire to a vector of concentration values uh, and that's what's written right here uh, since R works a lot it uses sort of vector notation like this where in this case CONC is a vector of values where each of the other elements within here have, is, is just a scalar value uh, so when you do that, you're going to get back a vector of values for FXA hat uh, corresponding to each one of the elements of, uh, of the CONC vector. You get that. And then finally, the last step is to throw in our residual variation on that. So that was normally distributed in this case with the mean FXA hat and a, and a standard deviation we called sigma in there and recall now you need to generate different values for each one uh, each element of the concentration vector so you have to generate length cons number of, of random variables here so again given a single row out of our posterior matrix you'll get a value in fact we can even demonstrate that let me uh, actually go ahead and just just sort of do the calculation down to there. Let's go down to, uh, well, let's go ahead. We can go ahead and create, start creating our graphics file here. Let's see if we can, let's go ahead and run this. I just realized since I'm not looking at the other thing, I can't tell when it's finished, can I? Take a second here. I guess I can tell when the hourglass goes away. Okay, I didn't expect it to take that long because we're actually not doing anything hard yet. We're not doing any tough calculations. The most lengthy thing in here is it does take a little bit of time to load uh, the MCMC samples back in, but the rest of this should be pretty quick calculations. Come on already. Well, let's see if anything's actually showing up over here. Let's Okay. 
Okay, nothing's happening in there. Oh, maybe we finally got there. Let's see. Okay, let's see if we can get this thing to open up a little bit. There we go. So we can actually see. Let's double check, make sure we didn't have any errors pop up that were evident. Yeah, everything's red, which is good. Okay, let's. Uh, Okay, so what we've done is I've gone and just down down to this. What I wanted to do is um, demonstrate. Oh, we, I don't think I I didn't define. We need to define the function. So let me hit that. Okay, what I wanted to do is show you what happens uh, when we put in some concentrations. Actually, let me also go through here. And this step right here, you can see I've defined the c min, c max, and n sim just like before. Uh, and then this next step is calculating uh, the appropriate C pred value, the predicted concentration values. Let's run that. Uh, let's try again. There we go. So, for instance, if you look at the C pred values, you'll see those listed. So you can see they're going equally spaced. They're all spaced by 8 going out from 0 to 1600. And what I wanted to demonstrate is what happens if we actually just do this function for one row of the uh, posterior matrix, just so you can see that process. So let me go ahead and uh, take that function, and we'll put in, uh, so we'll say posterior, and we'll just pick uh, some row of the posterior matrix. So I don't know, let's pick the 10th row here. Uh, of the posterior matrix, and then uh, I've specified the concentrations, which we called C pred in here. So I should get back a set of values, uh, the same, and the same number of those values as I've put in C pred values, and that's what happens here. So you, they, so here we've got C pred. There were 201 of them, so I should have yeah 201 of these. So you can see a collection of values then uh, that correspond to those concentrations in here. Okay. So and you can kind of see that our effect is coming from some value that's somewhere pretty low here near zero, you know, and then and then rises up until it fairly early on levels out to something pretty near 100 for that particular, uh, based upon that particular sample uh, out of our posterior matrix. So the idea is we're going to basically do that calculation I just showed you over and over again for every, one, every row in that posterior matrix. And that's what's going on in this statement right here. So you can see I'm using the apply function, which is basically a, a form of a loop then. In fact, you could do this as a for loop uh, in here, but usually an apply statement is uh, will compute things faster. So I'm doing an apply, and I'm going to do it over I, all the rows of my posterior matrix. So I've got the posterior matrix. When I say one, it means do this for every row of the posterior matrix. Uh, it runs that function, the function we defined, and I, sp and I have to specify the second argument in there, which we called CONC, and I'm going to make that equal to the C pred values we just calculated. So if we run that here, let's go ahead and run it. Take a minute here. Since it's, I forget how many rows we had in our posterior matrix, but it was a few, but that's not too bad. It knocked that off pretty quickly. You know, so you can get, if you want to get some idea, for example, if we look at, uh, you know, I forget the exact scale of this here. What is it? It's, uh, let me check the scale of it before I go printing something that's going to eat up forever to print. Okay, so you can see it's got 201 rows, so each row corresponds to a different concentration value and then it's got 3600 columns that correspond to all of our MCMC samples in here. So we've got that and then we do exactly at that point we have an object very much like the one we were working with uh, when we did the simulations in, uh, in inside of WinBugs and the next step is very similar. Notice that uh, here I create a data frame that's going to contain the predicted values and I have 
you know, I take my C pred values, repeat them three times because I'll need need them once for every statistic. So we're going to do again our fifth, fiftieth, and ninety fifth percentiles. Uh, and right here is where I take the, those predicted values and generate the corresponding quantiles. So that's similar to what we did before. And I create that label for which type of statistic, and then I combine that with another data frame with the same row, same number of rows, same labels, uh, and the observed data. Uh, and then finally, I do a plot. And in fact, this plot is this plot statement here should be uh, identical or near identical to the one that uh, we had used before. So that's so. Uh, but the big trick here is, if you if it's a trick at all, is essentially doing this process right here, where we generate our posterior predictions, but doing it inside R rather than inside bugs. So that'll create a plot that's essentially identical to what we saw uh, for the one that we generated with wind bugs, and we'll run this. Uh, in a minute to show that but then I wanted to go on to the next type of plot we wanted to do and recall that for that let's go back up to our assignment here yeah, let's close this Okay, there it goes. Okay, so let's open this back up here and just remind you what we we're going to do for that. Okay, now we're going to run slow at this end. Okay. For some reason it's not behaving. Let's see what happens when I try to Yeah, it knows it's there. Okay. For some reason, skim isn't behaving. Okay, well, that's easy enough. Let's close it. Okay, it's not going to respond at all. Then let's put it out of its misery here. Okay, let's try opening that back up here, uh, but not from there. I need it from Okay, let's see if it'll behave now. Let's see. Okay, we're on. Okay, so uh, as I say, we're going to be doing then the posterior predictive plots for our mean peak and mean AUC factor 10A inhibition. Let me step back a few slides here to something I showed you on Monday. Okay, so this is uh, where I had shown you the, an R template for doing 
Uh, actually, let me show you the plots. So the kind of the kind of plot that I'm looking for. In fact, uh, these in fact are the plots we're looking for, at least in the case of the mean AC. Uh, you can see over here uh, on the right. So I'm looking for these kinds of plots where we'll have a separate panel for each treatment arm. Uh, there will be vertical bars here, vertical lines that represent the observed value of the mean AUC for our factor 10A inhibition uh, versus time. Uh, and then there will be a in this case a density plot showing the distribution of the posterior predictions of that uh, mean AUC uh, for our for the group of patients we have here so suggested doing that or you could do the equivalent thing in terms of a histogram rather than the density plot which I show on the left so and and I had given you then this template uh, set of code uh, that you could build that up from. Uh, so, but let me go ahead and jump right to the the form of the solution as I did it, which is essentially this, other than now using names that are consistent with what we're doing in uh, in hands-on example two. So we're going to go down here then to uh, go past this. So, oops, moving too fast up slowly there we go so here here we are uh, using that the, the the template that I had uh, again things like now I'm using uh, the names here like fxa.pred so what I'm going to be doing here is now the simulation now by the way you could do the simulations here also directly in R but in this case I'll go ahead and use the uh, the population predictions that were already done from bugs that we kept from that. Uh, so we'll do that. So here we've got our statement pred, which is grabbing the appropriate columns out of the posterior matrix. Uh, the next steps in here, uh, the next step here is calculating uh, the statistic that I want, or the summary parameter, if you prefer to call it that. Uh, and in this case, in the first step here, I did that for yeah, this is for the uh, AUC, as I've labeled up here. So I'm getting the uh, AUC for our factor 10A inhibition by treatment arm. So you can see I use the aggregate statement to do that. Oh, and I guess the other thing to bring out here is the first step here uh, is I'm doing this for the observed data. So this line here is I'm going to calculate the AUC uh, for each individual then I will break them up by treatment arm and take the means over the individuals within each treatment arm. Uh, so, and that's kind of going on kind of all in one go right here. So we, I'm using the, where do we go here? Oh, I actually do it in two steps, that's good. So with the aggregate statement right here, I'm going to generate all of those uh, AUCs. So here you can see I'm going from one to the number of data points in my uh, in my data set in here I say okay break them up by subject and treatment arm or in this case the treatment arm is corresponds to the dose of our ME2 so break it up by that so for each one of those so when you break that up so for each subject and dose combination I'm going to apply this function which happens to be a call to a simple trapezoidal rule function in here which takes a set of x values and a set of y values in this case time and the factor 10a inhibition uh, values here uh, and you know, so it takes those and does the uh, the trapezoidal rule on those uh, i in here by the way is actually not going to be a single value it's going to be a vector of values that cor corresponds to a particular subject and dose arm in this so it'll actually be a vector so again these two will two things will be equal length sorry the the time and the factor 10a inhibition will be equal length vectors in there now the one thing I didn't do in here is I made an assumption I just realized I'm assuming that these things are already time ordered uh, which I believe is a safe assumption in the case of the X data uh, data frame we have here but if there is any reason to doubt that you should do a prior step where you would order them by time 
Uh, okay, and here, and of course I define that the X data that I refer to here is the, you know, is the X data defined previously. Uh, so that takes care of that. Uh, I gave, now that's going to create a data frame with a new column. I think it's actually sort of an unnamed or generically named column. And it will occur at the end that will contain the resulting AUCs. All the next statement is doing it is giving it a name of my choosing, in this case stat. Uh, and then down here I do the final step which is to take the means over all the values for each treatment arm. So it's another aggregate step where I'm breaking it up by uh, by treatment arm or by dose in this instance here and taking the mean. So that'll give me my mean values. Now that's just for the observed values. Now I have to do the same thing for each one of the MCMC samples. And the process is essentially the same except I now have to have to iterate then over all you know over all of those rows within my posterior matrix here and so that's that's the nonsense that's going on as we go through here uh, the first steps here are just creating sort of a skeleton data frame that contains the name so contains the subject and dose uh, in here that will ultimately contain uh, these values in here uh, and then this whole mess is actually a set of of nested uh, there's some nesting going on let's see here I gotta remind myself what I've got here so I've got a couple of nested loops in here the outer loop uh, is going to be I gotta remind myself what I did there um, okay yes yeah, so I'm gonna loop over subject and by the way in this case since I know that each subject corresponds to a unique dose. I don't also have to sort by dose. It's sufficient just to do it by subject. Uh, so I'm going to go through and grab each subject in here. Then I've got a then I've got this function here I define that I'm going to run, which is now going to go over that pred matrix, which has got which has got the same number of rows as the number of MCMC iterations and it's going to go through and pick off those that chorus the columns that correspond to a particular subject uh, from that uh, it will then generate the AUC's uh, the actually the AUC for that subject uh, for each one of those uh, you know for each uh, each row in the pred matrix in here and in the outer loop of course is going over all the subjects so in the end you'll have AUCs for each MCMC iteration and each subject and then the last step down here is both organizing it into a data frame and taking the mean the taking of the mean is happening in this part of the statement right here and when you're done with that you have the appropriate uh, format then for doing the plot so we've actually got two data frames now we've got one data frame uh, that that contains uh, the posterior distribution of the mean AUC's for each treatment arm uh, in here Let's see. Oh, wait. Sorry, I just got a Skype notification, but that will have to wait. Uh, okay. Um, anyway, so we've got one that contains the posterior predictions, and the other one that's called stat up here contains the corresponding observed values. Then we come down to the density plot form. Okay, it's moving slow again. Come on. And one minute it moves slow, the next it goes flying by. Here we go. Let's scroll down slowly, please. Okay, there we go. Here's the density plot uh, mess that we have for dealing with this. So it's saying density plot, uh, and it's for, remember we named that our object, which in this case is the AUC. We called it stat in the data frame here. Uh, the, and now this is initially going to do that then for the distribution, the posterior distribution 
of the mean AUCs here, and that's why stat.pred is the data set it's doing for. It's going to make do this, uh, create a separate panel for each dose group in here. Uh, and then down here I have this panel function where the first thing it does is it just creates that uh, the density plot for the predicted values and then the rest of this stuff is done to here it's going to pick off from our stat uh, data frame the corresponding sorry corresponding observed value and then this line right here creates that red vertical line at the uh, at the value of the observed uh, component in here and then this other bit down here is creating uh, some text inside there that says what fraction of the predicted values are greater than the observed value and it'll actually write that out on the plot itself and then the rest of this are just labeling things in here uh, the next little bit here the next graphics component here is the identical thing except it's going to do it as a histogram instead of as uh, instead of as a density and if you look you'll find that there's not a whole lot of differences so where you saw density plot in the previous you'd replace it with histogram and that happens right there and right there and then the only other little trick you have to throw in uh, to have it make reasonable looking ones is this statement down here where I say breaks equals no uh, in order for to get density plots where each one is on a different x x axis scale in here and you do it uh, the next bit in this in the solution set here it looks like we're gonna have to break off pretty soon we're actually at the end of our time but we've pretty well gotten there uh, the next step in here uh, you'll see is to do the identical thing but now to calculate the peaks and the real the only real differences you'll find there is when we go down to uh, where it go here well for instance in the case of the observed values you can see here instead of using the trap trapezoidal rule thing I'm just calculating the maximum uh, of the values for each subject dose combination and then a, a, you'll see an analogous thing happening uh, when we come down where to go yeah right here you'll see the max showing up here instead of using trapezoidal rule again so that's how we generate that that's really the only differences uh, let's go ahead and just uh, do a quick run on that thing hopefully it's a quick run uh, let's see control A go ahead and let it run actually we're repeating some of the things but that's okay So we're going down through here, crunch, crunch, crunch. Um, so you've actually seen this part already where we did the uh, R base predictions here. Uh, we're creating that plot showing the uh, factor 10A inhibition versus concentration. Now it's going through the steps to do the um, uh, to do the AUC calculations here. It's now in the middle of doing that for the predicted values. Doesn't take too horribly long there. Create our density plot and our histogram. And we'll do that all over again for the, uh, the peak uh, of our factor 10A inhibition. Just about to the end and we are to the end so let's take a look at that okay okay so assuming you did it in the same fashion I did there uh, that will show up inside uh, you'll see inside the ME hands-on 2 directory here it shows up uh, right here inside there under the name PPC plots 
You know, one, two, three, four, and five. Go ahead and open that. So now this is, if you recall, the one I showed you a little bit ago that was done using wind bugs to do the simulations. Uh, it was quite similar to this. Uh, in fact, it's nearly identical. You know, at most you'll see little bits of round off errors here and there, or uh, round off differences between them. But other than that, you're, they're they're identical. So that's that. Okay, and this is our, our density plot then for our mean AUC of our factor 10A inhibition. So you can see again, we have a separate panel for each dose group. Uh, you have the vertical red line, dash line here corresponding to the observed AUC, just using the observed data. And then you have the various density plots on there. Uh, and you can see again, for the majority of those, the uh, observed value is pretty well included enclosed well within the posterior predictions but then you have a couple of exceptions here you've got for the 30 and the 60 there seems to be uh, they seem to be a bit toward the tails and you can see that in the calculations too notice in most of these you can see like 0 0.4868 0 0.534 0 0.5 and so on most of those are fairly well within the cur within the bounds but then you get like here you get this one's out pretty well into the tail because it's 0 0.987 and this one's getting not quite as far out in the tail but also 0 0.0503 and then here's the identical uh, identical result but presented as a histogram instead of a density plot And I guess, by the way, in terms of distinction, it's, to some degree it's a matter of preference, but in some cases the histogram may show detail a little bit different because the uh, the density plot does do a degree of smoothing. Although if you like, you have some controlling control over the degree of smoothing. Uh, and then the next two plots are are the identical type of plot, but now done for the peak factor 10A inhibition. And that's the end of the homework assignment. Uh, so I guess I'll say goodbye and uh, I'll see you again uh, this coming Monday. Bye for now.